All right, so here I want to talk about parasitic infections of the digestive system. Now there are some common parasitic diseases that are going to be caused by these parasitic pathogens. We have toxoplasmosis, giardia, cryptosporidium, and we're going to talk about a couple worms, our whipworms and our hookworms. All right, so toxoplasmosis, toxoplasm gondii, is a protozoan. And this is going to infect a lot of worm-blooded animals. So you can see here we have our farm animals, we have some rodents, and of course our famous house cat. Now the primary host is the house cat, or cat species, and yes, can be a tiger. Infection is going to occur after eating infected meat, or ingestion of feces that the cat has been infected with or transmission from mother to fetus. So we have our mother to fetus, we have our infect in, um, eating of infected meats, um, or we have our transmission from our cat feces. It is a leading cause of death attributed to foodborne illnesses. And so the people who are going to be most at risk Or of course, pregnant women with cats. This guy can cross the placenta. And also our um, meat handlers, butchers. Now our toxo again is going to, um, for a healthy person, you are going to have um, flu-like symptoms, so I'm right, healthy. Um, your immune system is going to control, never, well I shouldn't play never, that we don't know, it does not clear. So you have more like a lifelong infection. And so this is important but because it can be reactivation. And you can have some sort of event, such as immune compromise, you get cancer, you're on immunotherapies, um, your radiation therapies, etc. Now, symptoms from mother to child is very important. So, let me move a few things around here. This guy's our primary host, it's our cat. We have our healthy people who get infected. And that's fine. And then we have our pregnant woman who gets infected. Now, this is congenital, which is mother to child. And so let's talk about the mother. If the mother is pregnant um, prior to pregnancy, sorry, infected, and then becomes pregnant, the fetus is protected. And it's protected by the mom's immune system. Now the problem is, when the mother is pregnant, and then gets infected. The mother has no immune response, and so this can lead to a miscarriage.
it can lead to stillborn. It can lead to congenital toxoplasmosis. And this is going to be an enlarged head. It's going to have potentially vision loss, mental disabilities, seizures. And of course, you can have ocular disease that gets reactivated and cause more damage. So it's a very invasive disease to infants. Now with respect to immune compromised individuals, you can also have severe infections if infected while immune compromised. Infection while immune competent can result in reactivation. And then so, again, this is not going to be as bad, but you can still have confusion, headaches, seizures, poor coordination associated with toxo. Now, diagnosis of toxo is going to be serologically. You can actually measure, they have kits to measure IgM, and this is especially important in pregnant women. Um, histologically, if the parasite is found in the tissues or the cerebral spine, um, spinal fluid um, that can also be a diagnostic. It's difficult to identify the parasite from the blood and there are techniques to identify the parasite in amniotic fluid. Now keep in mind, remember that you have your cat, draw a cat, and your feces. Now it takes plus two days for the toxo to mature and infect. So if you clean the kitty litter daily, this should avoid exposure to the toxo. So that's important just to point out that just because you have a cat and you have to change the kit, cat litter doesn't mean you're going to get it infected with toxo. As long as you're on top of things and change that thing every day, you're not going to give the toxoplasmosis time to mature into an infectious parasite. All right, so our next guy is Giardia. Giardia duodenalysis. Giardiasis is what it's going to cause. This is a large flagellate protozoan. This guy has a trophozoite that has four pairs of flagella that are shown here. So it's very distinctly. It also looks like a pear. So it has this like lovely pear structure. Now, Giardia is going to reside in the small intestine and it's going to absorb your nutrients from that small intestine. Now it likes to, has a big sucker so it can attach to your epithelial cells. It also likes to roll around. It's called tumbling. It's going to roll around your gut. In the colon, it's going to form a cyst. And this is important because this is where the flagella retract. And the cyst can survive, um, it's the infectious form, and it can be excreted in the feces, so the transmission is fecal oral. And it can survive in the cold water for months as well as resist chlorine. Now here is showing a trophozoite, and this is what the cyst becomes. So you have a cyst, and then it develops into a trophozoite, and it's called two trophozoites. You can draw a line down the hemisphere here. So each cyst will develop into two trophozoites. Now this guy is going to be found in fish, so you can get infected by a fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals.
Nasjardia can be from water, food contamination. Um, in epidemics, 60% are going to be asymptomatic. And you can have acute outbreaks. So again, the cyst is infectious. It'll develop into your trophozoites. And then your trophozoites are going to tumble around in your intestine and in the colon. They will form cysts and they will be released in your stool. And then you can keep the cycle going. Now, giardiasis is going to be associated with malabsorption of fats and carbs. And that's because when you eat, it's going to eat what you eat. And it's going to take all those and use it for its energy. Some of the mechanism for pathogenesis is going to be blockage of the intestine due to the large number of trophozoites present. It is going to be a parasite, so it digests and eats everything, so it destroys the microvilli, so you can't absorb your nutrients. It can damage bile production, and again, that helps it because you can't emulsify fats, so it's going to not allow you to emulsify those fats and absorb those fats. And it's going to invade your mucosal tissue and damage to the mucosal tissue. It causes turnover of those cells. Now, giardiasis is going to have symptoms occur about one to three weeks after exposure, and it's going to be sudden onset. So all of a sudden you're fine, and then you have explosive diarrhea, foul-smelling stool. Importantly, there's no blood or mucus associated with this. When it gets to the colon, it shuts down and becomes its infectious state. So it's not going to, um, it's going to become a cyst, so it's not going to be tumbling anymore or anything in the colon. It does all that in the small intestine, so there's no blood associated with that. You get abdominal cramping, a lot of flatulence, nausea, low-grade fever are all associated with giardia. Now, giardia is going to resolve typically on its own. It can persist in children and cause significant weight loss and malnutrition. It can lead to chronic stages in uh, adults as well, but eventually adults typically will clear this within a few months. Now our next guy is cryptosporidium, script, cryptosporidosis. This is another protozoan parasite. It's going to infect humans as well as have other animal reservoirs. It is an obligate intracellular parasite. So what this means is that it typically cannot um, survive outside very long and it has to move from, per from person to person or person to animal. It's going to be small, spherical, and you can see that it's on the outside. Um, it is going to arrange in rows on your microvilli. Now one thing that's important about crypto is that it's an obligate intracellular parasite, but it remains on the external side of the cell. So what basically it is, is if you have a cell, so here's your cell membrane. So here's, um, let me draw this, here's in the cell. And cryptosporidium will sort of settle on the outside of your cell. And it'll cause your membrane to surround it. So it'll create its own little kind of pocket. So here's a little pocket for crypto. And cryptosporidium will kind of hang out in that pocket. So it doesn't really infect your cell proper, but it still hangs out on your cell. So here's extracellular. And so you'll have all of these cryptosporidiums surrounded by your cell membrane. Um, and so that is why it's referred to as intracellular, but it's still in sort of its own little pocket. Now it is going to generate oocytes, and these will be excreted in the stool. Um, and the oocytes are going to be infectious. Um, so cryptosporidosis is going to have domestic animals as a reservoir as well. It has very high infectious rates, so those spores are very infectious. It's going to infect children, family, travelers, medical workers, etc. 
Infections by humans are mostly human to human, fecal oral, and you can get in contamination of water sources and food sources. Now for this, you only have supportive therapy only. You're going to have an immunodeficient patient's diarrhea that can be very severe, up to 25 liters a day. It kind of looks like a cholera type of infection. Importantly, in immune compromise, the disease can last for the entire life of the individual. Typically, about half the people with AIDS will die within six months of this infection. So this indicates that CD4 T cells are important. This is a parasite. You need a Th2 response. So you need to have your IgE. And this will help your mast cells and your eosinophils. So this is um, uh, dependent on CD4 health to get that IgE. Immunocompetent patients are going to have profuse, explosive, watery diarrhea, and this is going to last uh, one to two weeks, um, or it can be occur at one to two weeks after exposure and lasts about five days, and then it's going to rapidly clear. All right, so let's talk about a few of our worms. So we have Tricaris tricaria, and this is our whipworm. This is going to be about 30 to 50 millimeters in length, not too large. You're going to have a region that is very thin. Let's see if I can get this. So you're gonna have this very thin region, which takes up most of the body, and then you have this bulbous area. And so the female of the whipworm is going to produce 3,000 to 10,000 eggs per day. The adult worm can live for eight years inside of you, and there are about a billion people infected worldwide. This is going to be in areas where you have contamination of water sources, so indiscriminate defecation, warm humid environments, and it's going to infect people in the United States in the rural areas of southeastern United States. So again, you're going to have your lovely worm. It's going to lay its eggs. The adults are going to be in the sacarum. You are then going to have an embryonic, unembryonic egg that passes in the feces. It's going to take a period of time in order to um, mature. So in the case of our whipworm, the basically the female is going to attach to the colon and lay the eggs through the feces. In the soil, the egg matures 10 days before it's infectious. So this time period here is 10 days. Eggs are gonna be picked up by the hand and then they're gonna get swallowed. And then in the uh, duodenum, the larva mature and that takes one month. So this period here is one month. And then again, they're going to migrate to the um, cecum, attach, cause some hemorrhaging, ulceration, um, and then they're going to release their eggs. Now associated with this also can be a bacteremia because of the damage to your um, cecum. And so you can get your normal flora bacteria have access to your body. Okay, so let me see where I can put this. We have some, most infections are going to be asymptomatic with no treatment necessary. You're going to have moderate warm loads. But those with heavy warm loads, some children as high as 800 worms. And this is going to cause um, a loss of blood. It can cause anemia, a strain to defecate. Um, and so you can treat with a diazole. And this will help about 90% of the worms get eliminated. And so again, remember that a female can produce 10,000 eggs a day. 
And so if you have 800 worms inside of you as a child, that would be very, um, that, that's a lot of worms producing a lot of eggs. And then finally, we'll talk just really briefly about hip, hip, hookworms. So hookworms, again, have a life cycle that is going to be partially outside of our bodies as well. Um, we have Nicotara americanus and Ankylostoma duodenal are the two types of hookworms. They're pretty small, 10 millimeters long. They have a hook-like appearance that gives them their term, hookworm. Um, so you have this little hook. They have a worldwide distribution and the eggs are going to be deposited into soil. So here you have your eggs um, in the feces and this is going to form into a rabbit didophore larva and then you're going to get the filariform larva and this guy is going to burrow into the foot of a person. And remember they're going to burrow into the foot, they will migrate to the lungs and you will cough plus swallow them and then they will um, land in your uh, intestines and that's where they will mature into the male and female adults and they will release more eggs. Now majority of hookworm infections are asymptomatic. You can have some symptoms. You have a swelling, a rash, and swelling um, where the worm entered the skin on the foot most likely. You can have pulmonary problems if you have a lot of worms that are going through the lungs and trying to get to the um, abdominum. Abdominal pain, abnormal peristalsis for example. Other symptoms could be anemia, blood loss. Uh, you could also in children develop heart failure and some retardation, mental, physical development, especially if you have anemia. So anemia must be treated. Um, there are also some drugs that can be um, t used for this, but you can have preventions, which is sanitation, and to wear shoes.